or someone that we love. What is the worth of a soul? Well, when verse 10 says simply great, that doesn't explain much until you get to verse 11. Because now the Lord is quantifying things much more clearly. For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh. Wherefore he suffered the pain of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him. And he hath risen again from the dead, that he might bring all men unto him on conditions of repentance. Do you see the Lord putting his money where his mouth is there? How much is your soul worth? It's worth mine. I will suffer death in the flesh. I will rise again from the dead, all so that you might repent and come unto me. Notice that those two halves become a whole here. In verse 11, repent and come. Verse 12, bring all men on conditions of repentance. Please never separate those two in your head. If we think of repentance as something, I don't know, separate or distinct from coming unto Christ, we don't realize the relationship that the Lord is trying to renew. Why does He want us to repent? So that we can be with Him. It's our sin that's keeping us at arm's length or further. Our crying repentance is really inviting all to come unto Christ. But how do they come on conditions of repentance? How badly does Jesus want them to come home? Enough to pay the price of passage. I told you this was the carrot version of crying repentance. And when Jesus does it, how is he calling us unto him? Do you have any idea what you are worth to me? The fact I would trade places with you. I'll take your cross, Barabbas. I'll take your tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. I'll take the dirt that you pick up in your walk through life and wash it off onto the, the towel with which I am girded. I'll bear your scars. I'll suffer your pains and your infirmities. I'll do anything it takes because your soul is worth it to me. And what does he get out of the exchange? Look at verse 13. And how great is his joy in the soul that repenteth exclamation point. This is the first exclamation point we see in the Doctrine and Covenants. It's followed by two more in just another verse or so. And it's all in the context of repentance so that you can come back. That's how desperately I want you to return so that I can have joy with you. When we think of our sorrow and the thought of, of missing someone eternally, well, the Lord understands that far better than even we. And so what's riding on our repentance? The Savior's joy. Speaking of worth, it's what makes His sacrifice worthwhile to Him. But He doesn't stop there. Because typically, it's not just between Him and the person that needs repentance. What are Oliver and David being called to do? to cry repentance unto everyone. What were John Whitmer and Peter Whitmer Jr. told the work of greatest worth would be to declare repentance unto this generation. What were Oliver and Hiram told earlier? To say nothing but repentance. That's the message here. And so what's our role in all of this? Go to verse 14. Wherefore, a great conjunction, because of everything I've just said, because of the great worth of souls, Wherefore, you are called to cry repentance unto this people. Can we keep that calling in the context of what the Savior just said? By crying repentance to other people, I am bringing the Savior joy. I am making his sacrifice worth what he estimated it to be worth. The value of the soul that he is rescuing through it. And then he says in 15 and 16, and if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring save it be one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father! Exclamation point. And then 16, now if your joy will be great with one soul that you have brought unto me into the kingdom of my Father, how great will be your joy if you should bring many souls unto me! Exclamation point. Three exclamation points and four mentions of joy in this brief passage. 
back to seminary, I remember going through a kind of a word association game with my students. And I just throw up a word and they were just supposed to tell me the emotion that first popped into their head or their heart. It was Disneyland or pizza or a date, just anything to, to strike an emotion. And I wanted them to d identify the emotion immediately, just kind of gut check. How do you feel the moment you think about this word? And I did some positive ones and some negative ones, but they all seem to be non-related to the gospel until I put one up that said repentance. And it was so interesting to watch these teenagers as their stomach kind of, ooh, how do I feel about that word on a gut level? Up here in my mind, I might be grateful for the opportunity to change and, and repent of my sins. But on a visceral level, they felt negative about repentance. There's guilt and there's shame involved there. But look at it from the Lord's perspective. And as soon as you say the word repent to Him, what emotion comes? Joy. That's why I suffered. And nothing brings me more joy than to see someone on the opposite end of this relationship who agrees with me as to the worth of what we're exchanging. Your soul for mine. Maybe that's why it's so hard for us to repent. It's hard for us to come to agree with Jesus on what we're worth. There's no way I should trade places with you. It's like John the Baptist. You should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. Honestly, any of us, I think, would say, no, Jesus, I'm the one that deserves the cross, not you. I deserve the suffering, not you. But to see his joy in the soul that repents, you are worth that to me. In fact, you are worth that to the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. I so love the world that I would give my own life. Do you have any idea what you are worth to us? Notice he says to cry repentance. Crying is something a baby does. It's something we do when we're hopeless or helpless, when we are in absolute reliance on someone else for aid. That's crying repentance. He talks about bringing one soul, or if you've brought many souls. This is the chapter on the carrot. We're bringing not pushing, not threatening, not dragging them, kicking and screaming. We are bringing them unto a God who loves them, who finds infinite joy in their return and therefore considers it worth it to purchase them at infinite price. You know, if you think about the, the three parables in Luke 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy, also known as the prodigal son, joy runs throughout the entire chapter. The shepherd is bringing the sheep home on their shoulders rejoicing. The, the person who finds the lost coin probably spends more than the coin was worth to celebrate with the neighborhood. And what does the father of the prodigal son do? Kills the fatted calf, brings the robe and the ring, rejoices with him and with everyone. Because that one soul was worth it. If I can make a confession here, by the way, when I was a high school kid, I hated the parable of the lost sheep. Because it seemed, at least the way the Savior explains it, when he says the, he, the shepherd leaves the ninety and nine and goes after the one and brings it home. And there's more rejoicing in heaven over the sinner that repents than over the ninety and nine just persons who have no need of repentance. And that's the part that bugged me. Because I was trying. I, was, I wanted to be one of those ninety and nine. I wanted to stay on the Savior's side. So I did my best unsuccessfully, but I tried my best to do what was right. And so when I thought of Jesus and the Father rejoicing more over the people that weren't even trying, but someday they figured it out and came back, more than me who's staying by the Savior's side, now can you start to see why he tells the story of the prodigal son? Yeah, I was the older brother. But even before we got there, I had this incredible experience at one point when I was throwing this prideful pity party. Why do you like them more than me if I'm the one that's been good the whole time? The Spirit whispered, or probably thundered, Oh, wait, you're one of the 90 and 9? Oh, wow, what an honor to be able to meet you. Remember the description there, a just person who has no need of repentance. And that, that you qualify? Wow. You must be among some pretty impressive company. Can you list the other 98? Well, that might take a little while. Just give me, I don't know, 5 or 10. 3 or 4? 
Okay, fine. Anyone else in your select group of just persons who need no repentance? And that's when it dawned on me. I am the one. And we all are. Because we're all lost sheep. We're all lost coins. We're all prodigal sons. I'm not the older brother. I'm the prodigal. Because can you think of anyone that qualifies under the name just person who needs no repentance? Oh wait, there is one. But only one. And he's the one telling the story. The only one that has the right to feel that sting of injustice that there would be more joy over you than over him was the storyteller, the Savior himself. For him to say, of course the Father has more joy over you than over me, because I was never a question mark. He knew I would come home. We weren't so sure about you, the whole agency thing we fought for. Now do you understand why he would teach the story of the prodigal son and the older brother? An older brother who never left the father's side? Ah, now I know who you're talking about. But compared to the kind of natural man older brother in the story, we have the spiritual man older brother in reality, who doesn't just turn a blind eye to the father running out to meet us. No, he comes and runs right alongside the father to help us come home. He doesn't just allow the father to kill a fatted calf. He provides himself as the lamb without blemish. It's not just the father's robe and ring. It's I'll take my robes of righteousness and put them upon you, little brothers and sisters who have abandoned us, but who have finally come home. Can you not sense his joy in that? And can you not want to be a part of that yourself? To go cry repentance. I fell in love with that as a missionary. Changing from judging sinners to helping them return, to give them hope, to see their worth, their infinite value. That's why Jesus came. And no matter how few or how many will actually listen, it's worth it.